Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. Needing to know more about muscle, Dr. Andy Gulpin completed a PhD in human bioenergetics in 2011. And then he opened up his biochemistry and molecular exercise physiology laboratory at CSU Fullerton where him and his team now study the acute responses and chronic adaptations of human skeletal muscle in response to high force, velocity, power, and fatiguing exercise from the whole body, down to individual muscle fiber, and even into individual DNA. So in his spare time, he coaches professional athletes by tweaking whatever is needed to reach ultimate performance. Did I mention he's also an author of a very inspiring bestseller, Unplugged, which we'll definitely talk about more today. And also wanted to give a big plug to his amazing, insightful body knowledge podcast, which we may mention also. There are so many questions and topics that we have to discuss. But firstly, Dr. Andy Galpin, welcome to the show. Oh, it's a privilege to be here. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. I mean, I haven't even done you any service. There's so much more to say. And I don't even know where to start because there's so many topics that I know I can ask you about. So I guess just before we even start talking about your specialty muscles, I'd love to sort of just ask you to share with us, if you don't mind, a bit about why you're doing all this. And what I mean by that is you obviously are very intelligent and run a, an amazing laboratory and you're doing some amazing studies. But instead of letting the, I think you mentioned once that only seven people read each scientific paper, <laughs> instead of that happening, you're out here in the real world implementing what you're learning. And not only that, a sort of a step above that, you're actually sharing with people like my listeners all the information and everything you know and learn. So why are you doing all this? What's the purpose? Well, I actually think I want to go back to the beginning of your question, and I appreciate you again you saying all those nice things, but I want to make it really clear. There's a bunch of different ways that you can measure intelligence. And I mean, you were so gracious in calling me very intelligent, but I, according to all the metrics, I'm actually not. I didn't do great in school in terms of you know, GPA. I don't have a fantastic memory. And I, I want to say that to help people understand that the things that I'm doing, I'm not doing because I'm extremely intelligent, I'm doing them despite my below average intelligence in terms of the normal scholastic markers. I get what I get done because of my passion and my work ethic. And I really believe that that people have different skill sets. My skill set is actually not intelligence and, and memory and, and high processing like that. And so what I have done is I looked at the field that is typically filled with people of those high intelligence markers but they're not filled with the other skill sets that I am maybe a little bit better at, which is communication and, and transmitting science into the average person and teaching and storytelling. And I thought to myself, well, not too many people, I should say, are is spending a lot of time on that end of the spectrum and helping people be inspired and educated and entertained with current information. So I can sort of be a pseudoscientist and act like a scientist, but I guess that would be the answer to your question is the reason I'm doing it is because I felt like I don't have a skill set. And so if I compete with these folks on those same grounds, I'm, I'm going to lose. But if I play a different game, I think I can actually help people. I can not fake and do things that I'm not particularly good at. I'll do the things that I am good at, which is you know the stuff I mentioned. And if I can do that, I think we can really make some changes and get people the information that they need and that is helpful for them and to really make some improvements in quality of life. That's awesome. And look, I know you're going to argue with everything I say because that's the way you look at things, which is <laughs> awesome. But you can't argue that you know a bit about muscles. So I thought you could start by telling us a few things about muscle fibers and types and you know whether it's true that they're actually more than just type 1 and type 2, so slow and fast twitch, and if there's anything that apparently is called this extra fast twitch and, and maybe everything in between all of that. And all the recent sort of knowledge that you have on that would be awesome for you to share with us. Even the point that you made one day about muscle fiber types changing in as little as 14 days. Sure. Well, I will argue with that because even though this is my field specifically, I, I still don't know a lot. <laughs> There's so much more that I don't know than I do know. But the, the big picture, I would say the take home message is most of us are familiar with this concept that there are fast twitch fibers and slow twitch fibers and the fast twitch ones are the ones that make us explosive and jump high and the slow twitch ones are good for endurance. 
And that's entirely true at a very rudimentary or simplistic level. But it actually is a bit more complicated than that. And really, the, the fiber type exists on a whole spectrum. So there are the type 1s and type 2s, but there are also the type 2X fibers, which are the ultra-fast or super-fast fibers, but they're actually very, very, very rare. It almost makes it easier if you just think about it as 1 and 2, because the other ones are so rare, it's probably unlikely for any of you to find them unless you're actually extremely unhealthy or, or in some sort of pathological condition. But there's also fibers that are called hybrid fibers. And this is a one muscle fiber that is half fast or half slow, or half fast and half mega fast or ultra fast. And so really, it's easiest to think of it as it's not just like fast and slow. It is fast, you know, kind of fast, a little bit faster, a little bit less slower. And it's really just this big gradient in this big spectrum. And with regard to the second point of your question, the take home messages I would give to people on this topic, in other words, you know, why do I care? Well, those hybrid fibers are very indicative of, of disease, and they're also very indicative of physical health. So if you have a tremendous amount of those hybrid fibers, particularly the 2A2X or the, the fast, ultra-fast fibers, that tells us you're pretty likely to be unhealthy. And so it is important, especially when we start to recognize and realize the health regulation that goes on with muscle. So muscle is not just there to make us look good or play sports better, but it is probably the biggest driver of physical health of all the systems in the body. Low-functioning, low-quality muscle is a real problem. I think those are, are a bunch of reasons. And the major message I would stress to folks is you know, one of the things that we've realized in my laboratory has been fortunate enough to point out is that these fiber types can and do change. They change with things like aging physical inactivity, and they change with physical activity. And the type of activity you do determines how the change will occur. What I would say is everything that you do physically matters. Things you don't do also matter. So we have to keep in mind that you know when we don't feel like working out or when we don't feel like doing things, even if it's once a week, you can get it in. That's better than zero times a week. And that's really going to play massive dividends because as you alluded to, in extreme situations, we can see fiber types change, you know, go from fast to slow or slow to fast. They'll go both directions. And that can happen in as little as a few weeks. For most people, it's probably more like a four to six weeks. But that can still happen under those circumstances. We've also seen nutrition, particularly like high fat, high sugar diets, can alter fiber type composition, carbon dioxide concentration. So everything you do matters with physiology. There's no free passes. Everything affects everything else. So every little bit of good nutrition you can get, every little bit of good physical activity you get, it all adds up. And, and over the course of 40, 50, 60, and hopefully 80, 90 years, that's going to have a real impact on, on your physical health all the way down to the muscle level. Yeah. And the study that you did with the twins was amazing. Can you share us a little about that? Sure. So we were fortunate to identify what are called monozygous twins. So these are two twins that have the exact same DNA. From the reproductive perspective, what that looks like is one egg is actually fertilized by two sperm, and that egg splits in half, and so you literally have two clones. They're both born. This is identical twins. This is why you look exactly alike. So the nice part about that from a research or scientific perspective is you, you literally have two of the exact same people. And we were fortunate to find these individuals who were in their 50s, so 52 years old or so, I believe. And one of them had been basically, you know, played sports and was pretty active through high school and then hadn't really exercised the following 30 or so years. And the other twin had played sports in high school and had continued to do marathons and Ironmans and triathlons and things like that. So we had a perfect, I mean, just amazing study that, that gave us control of genetics versus lifestyle. So how much of these markers are determined by your DNA and how much are determined by your physical activity? So, for example, we took blood markers, bone density, muscle biopsies. We did performance and endurance and strength and power and a whole bunch of items. And what we wanted to identify are, it was twofold. One, what were the markers that were different between the two twins? If so, if they were different, how much were they different? And this gave us a pretty good indication of 
is it your genes or is it your training? And if it is your training, how much? You know, is it changing at 2% or is it changing at 8,000%? What's the relative expectation between differences? And we found a bunch of really cool, interesting data. The athlete, the trained individual was expectedly much lower body fat percentage, cardiovascular health, VO2 max, blood lipid panels, blood pressure, all that traditional health stuff was far superior in, in, the, in the endurance trained athlete. However, his muscle quality and his strength were actually worse than the untrained athlete. And when we looked at their muscle fiber type, the athlete was about 90, 95% slow twitch, which is exceptionally high. And the untrained athlete was more like 50, 55% slow twitch. And so that right there tells us not only is it physiologically possible, but it, it can happen to a very, very large extent given enough time. And so I think that gave us a bunch of insight into saying things like, look, going for a jog you know, a couple of times a week is definitely good for your cardiovascular health. If that's your only exercise modality, you're not going to be extremely healthy because that's not really going to take care of the things like strength or also quality. And from the other person's perspective, the other twin's perspective, he definitely needed to add some exercise into his health. So in addition, we realized that you know your muscle fiber type is extremely plastic and changing. And actually, and this is groundbreaking news for you, Allie, we, we just got this data back this week, so I've never told anybody about this. But we ran some gene analysis data on them, and the, the trained twin had a much lower level of muscular in inflammation. So the untrained twin had a lot of inflammation and a bunch of different markers that were pretty surprising. So hopefully we'll get the rest of those data out and published in the next few weeks, actually. But a bunch of really cool information came from that study. That's really interesting. I guess the inflammation didn't really surprise me, given that obviously, yeah. you know, we could probably assume that he was potentially doing too much endurance. It would have been great to have a triplet there with someone in between just to see how that yeah. panned out. A question about that. Awesome. <laughs> that would have been awesome. <laughs> Unfortunately, you couldn't arrange that. But an interesting question I have there would be if that athlete, and I know you're, you're just going to have to sort of take a guess here, but if that endurance athlete combined strength training with his training, do you think you would have got different results? Oh, yeah. I would imagine it would not have influenced his cardiovascular markers at all negatively. I think he would have been probably pretty much about the same. And I think his muscle would have been a lot healthier and he would have been a lot stronger. And I think that for him, just adding maybe once a week into his regimen would have been sufficient over the course of 30 years. I think it would have put him in a very, very good spot. And do you think perhaps even less endurance running and more strength would have even been more beneficial? Yeah, absolutely. I think his performances would have been better. He would have been able to pack on a lot more volume if he wanted or not. Either way, I think he would have been a better athlete, and I think he would have been a lot healthier from the collective definition of health. Mm. Absolutely. Interesting. Oh, wow. That's also interesting about the inflammation, and thanks for sharing with that. So I've got to talk to you about your awesome analogy that I've heard you talk about a few times and write about, and it's the analogy of the baker versus the cook versus the chef. And mm -hmm. I was hoping you could sort of briefly explain that and then tell us how you use that with your athletes. One of the things I try to focus on is taking information and helping people understand the greater understanding behind it. And so what I mean by that is with nutrition, it's very easy to understand because it's so confusing. And that sounds like I just contradicted myself, but mm -hmm. I, I said it that way on purpose. It's understandable why people are so confused, but just keep stepping back and keep zooming in. So actually, they're saying the same thing, but they're coming at this from perspective. And there's a difference between individual truth and how I put this into practice. And so what I mean by that is oftentimes we're not discussing whether we're talking about the actual data themselves or the information or the fact, or are we talking about implementation across your people you work with, across 100 million people, across 2 million. What are we talking about here? Because those are different things sometimes. With this nutrition thing, one of the things I realized quickly is I know a decent amount of the data and the science behind nutrition, but it doesn't always work like that in real life. I noticed you know, when I was failing with athletes and when, when I had other hurt people failing, I was trying to understand the trends between, well, what is it about why somebody fails and why somebody succeeds? And, and I quickly realized it has very little to do with the actual quality of the information. 
people are way too fussed about calories or grams or things like that. And that just wasn't explaining any of the problems. What I found quickly was that people have a hard time being effective when the information is not being delivered to them in a fashion that they like to receive it. With the nutrition, I came up with this analogy of identifying whether or not somebody is a cook or a baker. Now, any of you at home that, that like to cook and, and make your meals, you'll, you'll maybe realize if I ask you, what, you know, what's the difference between cooking and baking? And most of my college students have no idea because they don't do either. But baking is effectively chemistry. If you've ever baked a cake or a pastry or anything before, it is very specific steps. There are procedures. It is precise measurement. And there is no wiggle room for substitution for the most part. The order matters. Every little detail is important. If you screw one of those things up, your cake won't rise. Your bread won't work. You'll have a puddle of nothing. Cooking is quite the opposite. There's just a couple of ideas, and you can really the order what you put in the pan first, or you know, add just a pinch of salt to your tablespoon, add a little dash of this, and it's a lot less detailed. And both can be extremely effective. In fact, you can cook the same dish using both methods, depending on what you want to get, and it can turn out fantastic. So what I do with my athletes, or even my friends and family, is I try to identify whether or not they are a cook or a baker, and then I talk to them and I instruct them based on that personality trait. So what I mean by that is if I feel like somebody is a cook, then I'm probably going to give them one or two pieces of information or some concepts. So, hey, I want you to make sure you have vegetable every time you eat and make sure you eat protein every time you eat. And that might be the only instruction I give them. Or I might say something like, here's the goal. I want you to get to about this many pieces of fruit a day and this much stuff of this. And, many, and just it's very, very simple. I do not prescribe calories. I do not prescribe time. I may say something like, I want you to eat you know, as often as you can, every couple of hours or something like that. And I want you to do blah, blah, blah. So I can still get to any of the ideas that I need to get to, but it's really more of a concept base. If you give that, though, to somebody who identifies as a baker, they're going to freak out and it's not going to work. Classic example is I am genetrician, more of a cook. And so if you tell me to walk around and you talk to me like a baker who needs extreme instruction absolute precision and you make me carry around a weight scale and I have to have a timer go off and you know I eat every three hours when my buzzer hits and I don't eat it two hours and 59 minutes and I don't eat three hours and two minutes I eat exactly at three hours and I measure you know six and a half carrots or you know whatever it's going to be I am going to react adversely to that I'm not going to follow it it's going to be too much work it's going to be a pain in the ass and I'm going to eventually give up but a baker is going to give up when you talk to them just in general concepts because they actually want that level of detail. It actually gives them a relief and sense of like, whew, we have a plan. We're on board here. So people who are planners, people who are, you know, type A's or ACDs, they tend to be more of like, like a baker and they want tremendous instruction. They want a lot of detail. People who are more laissez faire are going to be a cook. I might have two athletes, one who's a baker and one who's a cook. They might be literally eating the exact same thing. But the way I discuss that and communicate that information to them is completely different. And I set them up, hopefully, in the best position for them to succeed. That's awesome. And I assume also that it, depending on what you do, you may flip between a baker and a cook. Like, for example, I'm sure even though you mentioned you're a cook, I'm sure you're more of a baker when it comes to in their lab doing the scientific stuff. I'm actually more of a cook there, um, <laughs> which is why I employ a lot of bakers to work actually in the lab. Oh, gosh, yeah, okay. Uh, for that exact reason. Yeah, so right. I, I do the high-level things, you know, hey, I think we should approach this problem this way. Here's a creative design. This is what we do. But they're actually the detail because I'm actually quite poor at those things. I, I can do it, but I, it takes a lot of energy out of me. And so I put people on my team in places where they're going to succeed so that the bakers that are very good like that are in baker roles. And the cooks that are not good, I don't have them do baker jobs. Yeah, right. And Dr. Galpin, you're often called in to help an athlete just tweak to get that full performance. And when I say called mm -hmm. in, there's normally a team that's involved, like different coaches, and they sort of call you in. Can you give us a bit of an example of where you've been called in and you've used this approach and it's worked quite well? Oh, man, I, basically every time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually have a fighter, a UFC fighter, who's just started his camp. He's fighting Scott Holtzman. He's fighting December 9th. He's definitely a baker. He's actually very educated in nutrition. He's very sharp. He takes rigorous notes almost every day of, of everything he does, and he's got detail. He'll look back to his training logs, and he's very, very detailed, and he's a blue-collar guy. He wants instructions, and he wants to go to work. 
he likes having a plan in place and he's just very, very sharp. So I come in with him and this is actually the third fight I've worked with him on. And the first camp, actually, I screwed it up. Like I gave him too much salt you know, for his weight cut stuff and his, his other stuff and it didn't work out great. But he was actually happier to be oversalted than he was not have a very specific plan. So he was actually happy. He's like, oh, okay, this happened. But you know, he was like, I was just so relieved. There's no anxiety. There's no guesswork. So the second camp were perfect. But now this is his third time going through it. You know, I started with a very specific plan. I didn't know what it was going to be because you know it's all just guesswork. But now after a couple of times, I've been able to titrate a few things, adjust a few things, and now he's going to be rock solid and rock on plan. So that was a time where we very much implemented Baker, and he's had a tremendous amount of success so far. Awesome. Yeah, it's really apparent too that even though you're a scientist, you really have to take psychology on board. And I loved your interview <laughs> with the conscious coaching Brett Bartholomew. And you refer to psychology as playing such a big part in performance. Can you share us a bit of an example of where like science and psychology has perhaps muddied the waters and made it hard to draw any conclusions? Yeah, well, as Brett would always say, we got to remember, these are people too. Mm. <laughs> like they're, they're mm. not scientific experiments. They're really people. If you just let that sink in for a second, you could pay me $1,000 an hour to be your personal diet coach. And I'd have to adjust every five minutes because what happens in your real life adjusts what happens. You know, you get a bad email and you get super stressed. That has a physical response. I mean, you get goosebumps, temperature goes up, stress levels go up, hormones change. Well, if we know food has a direct relationship with hormones and vice versa, I literally have to adjust your food based on what's going on through your hormones. And we realize that your hormones and your neurotransmitters and your energy and your psychology being altered second by second throughout the day. So it'd be pretty silly for me to think that I can then for just, you know, look at how big you are and how tall you are and all of a sudden come up with a food plan. So it's really, really ridiculous and short-sighted for us to think that we have to remember that there's people. I could give you a hundred real life examples of these stories where I had one particular athlete who's an Olympic athlete and she loves to do this particular weight cut thing when she's you know getting ready to weigh in before competition and i mean the science is extremely clear and all of my years of experience are very very clear and most people in the field practitioners so you kind of have the evidence base fully backed up here you know science your own personal experience and most authorities or experts in the field are all in agreement with this concept she likes to do it the opposite way she doesn't like to do it this way and so when I first started working with her, I explained her the science, I explained her my experience, I had several people weigh in, and so she's mentatively, cognitively, completely believes me, and she's totally on board, she's amazing, she listens, and she understands that this is not the best way to do it. And so the first time we did it, she wasn't happy, and I could tell, so the second sort of time comes around, and eventually, the second time, I went, you know what, why don't we do it your way? She was like, really? <laughs> Because what actually happened was like, I was on the phone with her and I hung up and my wife was listening, sitting next to me. And she looks at me and she's like, you know, she doesn't want to do it that way. I'm like, I know, but like, it's going to work better and she's going to be happier afterwards. And she's like, but she's not going to sleep all night. She's going to be up the next 18 hours, not doing this. I'm like, Shit. You're right. So I called her right back. I'm like, do it your way. And she's like, really? Oh my God. I'm like, she's like, is it going to be way worse? It's slightly worse. It's significantly worse. But what I had to do is tell her. It is going to be a little bit worse, but I think the fact that you're not going to sleep the next 16 hours, because I know you don't want to do it this way, is going to be worse, actually, than if you follow the right thing. So go ahead and do it your way. And she's like, oh, my God, thank you. And so she crushes it, sleeps perfectly all night and makes weight, and, and she's totally fine. Hmm. That's just an example of like we have to factor in psychology. And I, and I try not to dance too much in that world because I'm not a, a psychologist or a sports psychologist, but you don't have to be. We just have to be human. They're people. And we have a fantastic sports psychology staff. My colleague, Lenny Weirsman, works with a tremendous amount of athletes. And actually, I don't know, some significant percentage of the athletes I work with actually work with him as well. Or I get him over to work with him. And so I just ask him a lot. I'll call him constantly and say, hey, this is what's going on. Here's the information I want to get across to him or her. How do you think I should handle this? What language should I use? And he coaches me to get through that. And so I don't have the arrogance to think I all of a sudden am also a sports psychologist. So I know I don't know that area. So then I ask somebody who does know that area. And I think that's how we effectively communicate and get the athlete or the regular person in the best position possible to succeed. 
Yeah, I love that team approach that you have and you just sort of take the ego out of it and go, well, hang on, who are we actually trying to help here? We're helping the athlete, yeah. which is very rare, unfortunately, but it's awesome to see. So I've got to talk to you about your Unplugged. It's an amazing book and it's interesting because I guess the first question I have for you is did everyone become miraculously fit in 2016? <laughs> <laughs> because you mentioned that something like – I think 67% of growth in fitness wearables from 215 to 16. So did that correlate to amazing fitness amongst our society or? Um, you know, it turns out it uh, sure didn't, right. did not. Right. So I think they're predicting $30 billion of wearables in 2020. Yeah. Yep, and that doesn't even count things like GPS. I mean, that's just simply talking about basically – wearables, watches, Apple watches, Fitbits, things like that. So the, the whole industry is probably going to be closer to 100 or $200 billion. Well, surely it motivates people to a certain extent. Tell us a bit more about your research. I was actually out of talk this morning because it's actually Saturday afternoon for me, even though it's Sunday at 5 a.m. for you or something horrendous, right? Yeah. Man, by the way, good on you. He's getting after it. <laughs> but I was out of talk this morning, and there's this idea of telemedicine. And this wonderful scientist here at Long Beach, Michelle Allencar, does a bunch of really interesting work in this area. And her research is suggesting, actually, that people that have comorbidities, so these are people at very high risk of ill health, are actually the most likely to throw fitness trackers away and not use them. So that's a particular problem, who the people who are in the most need for physical activity and the most need for motivation or adherence or whatever metric we're interested in are the least likely to actually use them. And their data also showed that when you take people like this and you give a tremendous amount of them health trackers and fitness trackers, some of them, of course, succeed. But the ones who don't get a fitness tracker are actually twice as likely to lose weight than those who get a fitness tracker. It's interesting because I, you know, I wish half of these data that she had were available last year when I wrote the book. But it, it honestly, it seems to not matter. It's just more and more studies from areas all over, from psychology, from physiology, from behavioral psychology, just continue to mostly show the same thing, which is that these markers, these trackers are not helping anything. And that doesn't mm -hmm. mean they can't be useful at all, but they're not working. And in fact, the vast majority of them are demotivating or sending people in the wrong direction. And we're spending millions of dollars a year here in America alone trying to unravel what the hell is going on here. Why isn't this working and why is it pushing people more towards ill health? So with the book, what I really wanted to do is help people understand, because I'm not anti-technology. I'm not saying, oh, uh, you know, don't buy a, a, a new watch or don't buy a new cell phone that tracks your fitness or these things, because that stuff is here. In fact, it's the, the American College of Sports and Medicine announced that it is the number one health trend in the world in 2017 is fitness trackers. So they're not a fad. They're not going away anytime soon. They're only going to get larger. And with the book, I wanted to help people understand, okay, we can have success with these things. We have to understand the common restrictions, the common problems, so that you can put yourself in a position to potentially have success and to mitigate the risks of the problem. So that's really what that book was about. Yeah, and just to play devil's advocate, I mean, I find those sorts of devices quite helpful in actually in athletes to help them become better understanding of their body. And what I mean by that is so, for example, if their training stress score is very high and they don't want to exceed that because they know that the next week they're not going to be recovered and using those sorts of stats, what do you think about that? I think that's that's perfect. That is exactly what we wrote in the book. You know, 16 stars for you, A+. plus, Fantastic. That's one of the many ways where they can be helpful. These trackers can be amazing for accountability. They can be great for awareness, for calibration. Those are all excellent tools. But exactly, I love how you phrase that because they are only successful when you use them to learn more about your own body. That's the missing link. They have to be used to help you feel and understand what's actually happening with your body more. They cannot be used as the actual answer themselves. That's the, one of the major mistakes people make is if you outsource your own intelligence, if you outsource your thinking, your own physiology to these devices, you're going to lose. 
If you can use it, though, to further understand what it feels like when you're stressed, when you're underperforming, when you're overperforming, whatever metric it is, then you actually have learned more about your body. And that is a far longer lasting and far more accurate metric than any of these very cheap, very inaccurate, very unreliable and often invalid markers. Mm, I guess, too, it's that balance because you're probably familiar with Irresistible by Adam Alter and how he talks about addiction. And it's when does it become an actual addiction? Yeah, well, that can happen, too. Mm. Absolutely. And, um, and this is another thing we want to be worried about is, is we want to make sure we're putting our emphasis on the right place, right? So are you addicted to beating the score? Are you addicted to make sure you're hitting the metric that this thing is telling you? Well, then you've actually formed probably an unhealthy behavior. And so, like, we don't want that either. We want you to be using it for the sake of feeling better physically, not winning or beating or checking a mark off because motivation like that either completely goes away or it becomes unhealthy. Mm, and you've probably heard if it's not on Strava, it doesn't count. And a lot of athletes sort of abide by that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not familiar with that, but I get the idea. Yeah. yeah um, I, I don't use Strava, so I'm not sure. But I loved your book and it's just great to be able to take the devices away, use them, and then see mm-hmm. if you can take them away. And, and I love that approach and I really recommend that to our listeners. I want to ask you, and, and I'm a bit sort of scared because I know you're going to say it depends, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. Ali Fitness Podcast is all about bringing health into fitness. So I guess it depends and there's a lot of individual factors. But given everything you know, what advice would you give to our listeners who are aiming for longevity, health, and fitness? We can do that one. Okay. I think that's a lot easier than what people think it is. So yes, it depends, but there's some benchmarks we can go after. And one of the underlying principles or overarching principles, I should say, of the book is the fact that this is the more important conversation, I think. These are the things that are going to really help people, not the other little minutia. The detail is actually what probably inaccurate for the most part. And if it's not inaccurate, it's generally not going to be useful. So let's have bigger conversations about redefining what health means and redefining the bigger picture in the landscape so that people can go, okay, well, I can't do A, B, C, and T, but I can do E. And then, okay, I can do G. And if we get people the concept of what they're trying to get after, in other words, if we talk about health and fitness, like the whole world is a bunch of cooks, and we don't teach them like a baker, then people can mix and match. And so we can actually finish my cooker and baker analogy because the third trifecta to that is a chef. And so a chef is somebody who is an expert, right? But a chef spent so many years, five years, 10 years, whatever happens to be, following the exact rules so that they learned exactly what's going on to such detail, they can actually now start breaking some of those rules and they can treat baking like a cook because they have that tremendous amount of expertise and they understand exactly what everything is doing in the steps so then they understand what can be exchanged and what can't be exchanged well the problem is people want to jump in for the most part right into chefdom and then their food tastes terrible and they're trying to be too fancy or it gets complicated and they quit they get frustrated because they're trying to make a meal that's well outside their expertise and they're not following the exact rules or they're following 80 percent of them but baking doesn't work when you follow 80 percent you know you end up with nothing so if we step back and just go, whoa, whoa, okay, okay, let's just talk about some concepts. And some of you who want to go on and eventually be chefs and you want to put 10 or 15 years into this or you really want to read and listen to podcasts and stuff, you can eventually learn to break some of these rules. But for now, let's just talk about the basic concepts. And so in the end of the book, I lay some of these things out with a little program that I put together. And I think we put it as like the gold standards, the silver standards, and the bronze standards. Those are just arbitrary, but I tried to help people understand things like, okay, well, depending on where you're at, let's talk about some concepts. So for the average person that just wants to be healthy, maybe lose a little fat, maybe add some muscle, but maybe energy, sleep better, etc. I think we have to expand the conversation a little bit to what all encompasses physicality and physical health. So if we look at the markers of independence, we look at the markers of mortality, how long you're going to live by yourself, how long you're going to be mobile. Those tend to be markers like leg strength. We showed that in our twin study, the same thing, right? VO2 max, body fat composition, leg speed, leg power are important so that you can catch yourself from a fall, and some other markers. 
And so if we just kind of map that out in under a week, it says, okay, so for the average person, maybe do something once or twice a week or something that is kind of heavy. That, that's the only information I'm going to give you. I think that's about as complicated as it needs to get. Then maybe once or twice a week, do something that's a little bit less heavy, but you're going to do maybe five or 10 or 15 or 20 reps of it. Okay. Then maybe once a week, do something that requires your heart rate to get really, really, really high and you're out of breath. Maybe that's intervals or something. Maybe not. Who cares? Up to you. And then maybe do something once a week that requires you to sustain energy over time. So maybe 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, 40 minutes an hour, whatever. And if you start mapping this stuff out, you, know, you can kind of combine some of those things. They don't have to be different workouts, but those are the end goals and the metrics. And I think for the average person, if they once a week they picked up and pushed and pulled something that was kind of heavy, and once a week they did the same thing but did it for a few more reps, and then once a week they did something that required their heart rate to get really, really high, and once a week they did something that required their heart to sustain exercise output for 30 or 45 minutes or an hour, I think that's going to put most of us in a really, really good spot. So I know that was a long answer to your question, but. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I love how you take this basic approach because so many people now it's just so complex and people are just so overwhelmed that they're like, oh, it's all too hard. And you're like, no, actually it's not just lift heavy twice a week, sprint once a week and eat whole foods. Those are even a bit arbitrary. Don't even take those level of detail at that level of detail. I think that the easiest way I can see all this stuff is the more ways that you can challenge your body, the more variation, probably the better. Having said that, you do want variation, but you do still want what's called progressive overload. So we have to keep making the challenge a little bit differently. So variation is not randomization. So don't just make stuff up as you're going. But we do want to do things differently. So once you get adapted to one thing, say, oh, okay, let's try a little bit of this over here. And I think that those are really, for most of us, just more important. Keep challenging your body to do things that it's supposed to be able to do, and as many of them. From there, we can start exploring with different fun things, like fasting or cold or breathing work or different types of workouts. And But change the mode. You know, Get on a bike, lift some weights, get in the water, get on a rower use bands, use kettlebells. All these different things are all great tools. And, and don't be so worried about oh, is one better than the other one. They all have pros and cons and advantages, but worry about that once you become a chef. For now, just get moving and, and then get better, and, and then you can go from there. But quite frankly, Doctor, I think some of the bakers would be freaking out at this. They need yes. they need numbers and they need figures and they need to know, but how much of that and, and what exactly do I need to do this week? Yep. Yeah, that's, that's fine. So here's my recommendation. And then that's a very good point. I thank you for bringing that up. My recommendation is then work with a professional that will give you that. Invest in a coach, invest in a trainer, guy one online or get one in your area or something like that, that gets you on a very specific, probably four to six week plan. That usually seems to be about the sweet spot. So if you plan things out in four to six weeks blocks and then kind of adjust and change from there, and don't necessarily matter if it's the optimal plan, to work with because having a plan is more important than if that plan is perfect for most of us. Mm, I'm glad you and, said that. And then that. reassess after four to six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because I have so many clients come to me and they say, Oh, I'm doing this. Is this what I should be doing? And I'm like, um, we need to talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. It's quite funny. It depends on your goal. Yes. And so I can't answer that in a one sentence without sitting down and actually knowing, well, what's your goal? That's an awesome point. And I think you're right. I think if you really want to do things right, you know, get the best results, then yes, you need a trainer. And but and also you need to map out and have a plan as opposed to, you mentioned earlier, just randomly doing stuff. Yes, yes. And I want to go back actually. I know I said it, but may want to emphasize that again. Variation is not randomization. Mm. Those are two entirely different words. And the science is extremely clear that when you have a very specific goal in mind, especially if that goal has a deadline, that having a very specific plan is far more important and more effective than not having a plan. The actual type of plan you use is maybe a little bit less important, but you cannot just go into these things with no plan. And like for all of my athletes, if they've got an eight-week camp before their fight or something, we have the entire eight weeks mapped out. It's color coded. And we might have not have every single repetition or every set or every intensity rest interval plotted out, but we plot them out by outcome goals. And so here's what I mean by that. Let's say they've got a fight in eight weeks. 
So we'll start backing up and we'll say, okay, say you're fighting on a Saturday. Now we'll say Friday is making weight and Wednesday we want to be at this. And by Monday that week, we want to be at that. And we start backing the weeks out and we start color coding them. So the week before is probably what's going to be a red week and that's going to be conditioning and it's very hard. But the week before that might be two red days and then a green day and a yellow day. And then we back all these up up and green, red, and yellow are indicators basically of just saying it's a really hard day or not. And what we do is we make sure that that the volume and the difficulty level is prescribed throughout that entire eight weeks with the varying degree of mixing and matching reds and yellows and, and greens. And now I don't necessarily know what they're going to do on those exact days sometimes because sometimes their sport coaches change that. But they know when they walk into this practice, say it's a Monday of week three, and it says green, and at the top it says speed day, they know, okay, it's a speed day. I'm going to try to maximize getting fast today. That means I'm going to take a lot of rest, and I'm not going to do that many repetitions. And if I'm starting to get tired, I'm going to stop, take a break. Because the goal today is not to get tired. The goal of today is to move fast because tomorrow is a red day. And we're going to work on our conditioning or whatever it happens to be. And so we program them by outcome goals. This is the, the adaptation we want to get out of the result of today. But we give them some flexibility about how they go about that. So that is a good example of variation, but it is not randomization at all. Mm, absolutely. It's very planned. Now, that's excellent. Yeah. And Dr. Galpin, just to, to go back to technology for a moment, where do you think it's going to go? You're probably familiar with Kevin Kelly's book, and he talks about the inevitable. And yes. to be honest, I had to put it down because um, I loved it, but it scared me somewhat. I sort of got to the part about, and then you go out for a run and you're running along and you have these glasses on and it tells you your friend was here five minutes ago and they took this route. Would you like to take that route? And this is what your metabolic rate is right now. And here I am in nature getting overwhelmed by these stats. Do you think it's going to go there? Oh, no doubt. It already is there for the most part. I mean, I was just at that technology conference today. Uh, I work with the special forces here in America and DARPA and a lot of other companies that are in these things. So I called it at NASA and we've done some stuff with NASA. And we already have some pretty amazing artificial intelligence suits that are just basically T-shirts and undergarments that you put on. And these are going to measure everything from your sweat rate to your emotional state to anxiety and things like that. And this is all going to be integrated into artificial intelligence. And these programs are already already around some of them are actually going to be built into exoskeletons, so they'll physically move a part of you or not a part of you. So it's not a question of if that's coming. That is all, all right here. Yeah, it's all here. And a lot of these things are actually on the market already in, in various forms. So, Ali, we're not even talking about 30 years from now. I mean, depending on what country you're in and your income, you might have some of these things already. And this is actually another reason why we wrote the book is to say, like, you better learn these things now. Because it's going to be very, very hard to say no to that stuff when it gets here. One of the lessons that my dad taught me was, you know, before you go and walk into a physical challenge, you make your decision about what would have to happen for you to say no or stop or quit and what wouldn't be a reason. And you make that decision before you get into the middle of it. Because if you try to make that decision halfway through, you're going to make very stupid decisions. So you have to be able to look at this stuff objectively. And this is really what, what we talked about in the book is you got to make that decision now. Decide what are your ground rules? What are you willing to give up? What are you not willing to give up? Understand the consequences. Understand the benefits too. And put yourself in a situation so you don't wake up one day going like, oh my gosh, I, I haven't gone for a run without my AI glasses that tell me everything what to do in, in five years. And now all of a sudden, I don't know how to jog when my battery goes out or I don't know how to coach. I don't know how to train an athlete when the software system I use isn't working. And that, that's going to be a real, real, real problem. And this doesn't even get into the fact that the vast majority of things are, as I mentioned earlier, they're extremely inaccurate. They're not telling you the correct information. They often are reliable, but they're also almost always invalid. And so now you've really outsourced your entire ability. Your bullshit detector is gone. And you've given it to something that we've known scientifically are just all these things are inaccurate. And so we just have to be very, very careful. We have to set ourselves up some scaffolding and some frameworks, some foundation. It just says, well, what's the point here? It's all supposed to come back to enhancing my own physiology. And if it's not, then this is not really going to be effective because eventually, if you want to hear the, you know, Kevin didn't get into this stuff, but if you want to hear the long term, think of it this way. 
depending on where you think, how old you think the human species is, and we've had a couple hundred thousand, maybe a million years to evolve. And every single thing we've ever done as a species had one single point, which was to reduce stress, right? So let's make food easier so we don't have to go through hunger stress. Let's build shelters so we don't have to go through thermal stress. Let's come and form tribes so we don't have to stress about who's safe and who's not trustworthy, things like that. Well, what we didn't do, and this is the giant problem with artificial intelligence, is artificial intelligence is only going to be as good as the question that we ask it. And the question is simple as, hey, make sure that we reduce human suffering. All the crappy, weird stuff aside, what if reducing human suffering is not the right question? Because we spent two million years evolving to reduce human suffering, and oops, it worked. And now we're living in this age of abundance. We're walking around. There is no physical stress, at least, again, in in the developed countries in, in America and things like that. There's no physical stress, there's no thermal stress, there's no hunger stress, there's no real job stress, nobody's worried here about for the most part, uh, although some people are suffering and homeless and stuff like that, the vast majority of us are not really physically stressed at all, and so we are rampant, and we're the sickest we've ever been. So what if reducing stress was the wrong question to ask? And so eventually we're going to have to get to a place where we decide we're going to have to do one of two things. We're going to have to engineer suffering. We're going to have to choose discomfort or we step out of the physical being and we decide to leave the molecules and the cells behind and we evolve or alter to a different form, a lifestyle or or life form and become some sort of energy being like Dr. Manhattan. Because the physiology that we built over time is meant only to function when exposed to a wide variety of stress. Autophagy is a fantastic example. Autophagy is when you sort of clean up all of your cellular debris. So all the broken down, kind of improperly functioning garbage that's floating around your body. That cascade is almost always only kicked off during extreme cold exposure or extreme hunger or extreme dehydration. Well, now all of a sudden we're not doing any of those things anymore. So we never go through the cellular debriefing mechanisms that are available to us. And so we end up with the body floating around full of crap and half functioning cells. And of course, now we get sick all the time. So what if we ask the wrong damn question? We're going to have to make that decision. And that is really where the whole thing is leading to is we're going to have to give up the physical being. We're going to have to choose a lot more suffering. Mm, interesting. And I guess that's why people are, are going to, to these Spartan races and obstacle course mm-hmm. racing to experience some of that suffering that you're talking about. Yeah, and it doesn't even have to be that crazy, by the way. So I think that a lot of us can get started with something like, oh, let's just do, you know, an eight-hour fast or exercise. Exercise is just, you know, engineered suffering, right? It's arbitrary that we that we had to build back into our lifestyle because we lost so much physical activity in our day-to-day lives. So it doesn't have to be crazy, although some of us may need these extreme suffering things, but maybe some of us that is just simply taking a cold shower. Mm. That's a good start. Yeah, so that's the future of technology. But what about the future of – I loved your interview on health from a sort of high-level perspective. You talked about the fact that 97% of our health care, or at least in the U.S., is all about treatment, and there's actually only 3% given to prevention. Yeah. Where, yeah. Where's that going? My opinion is that we have to separate health care from health prevention, and, and I mean that from a logistics and a legislative perspective. Physicians are no longer the people that we go to to ask about diet and health and exercise. They're the people we go to when we are, hey, I've got diabetes, hey, I've got cancer, hey, I've got some disease, so they can treat and manage the disease. But they have to step completely out of the prevention perspective because they don't know what they're doing. They're simply being asked to know too much information. And just like we talked about the very, very, very beginning of the show here. You know, I'm like, I don't know that much information about exercise and health, and that this is what I do. So thinking that a physician who's trying to spend their entire day learning which drug to give somebody to treat their cancer, expecting them to know the same information when this is my profession, it's ridiculous and it's unfair to them. So this is not an indictment at all on physicians. It is way too much that we're asking of them. But the fact that there's just so much more information in the world, I mean, there's more information gained every year than there is in the previous total amount of information ever in human history. And so medical care is no different. We're just asking them to do an impossible job. So I think the way that we tease that out is we just simply say, look, MDs are no longer the king of all things health. 
They don't know anything about exercise or nutrition. They know about acute disease and acute sickness treatment. And let's keep them focused on medicine. And we'll keep other people, elevate them on the other side, which is you're not sick, you're not hurt right now, but you don't want to get healthy. Okay, well, you need to go see this other physician, but this is an exercise physician. This is the strength physician. This is what they do. Mm. And I think that is the real future for those things. And when we can leave the physician in the medical field to, oh no, something bad happened that was out of our control. Now what's our best treatment course? The conference I was just at today just announced they're trying to develop a recognized exercise prescription registry or something. And at least, again, this is all in America. It is starting to become much more rampant and will be becoming huge that insurance companies are going to be paying for true preventative costs. So things like your gym membership may be covered, your health insurance may cover these things. Seeking out a health professional is very likely to be, and I mean health professional like a personal trainer, physical therapist, strength coach, things like this, not when you're hurt, but true preventative measure are probably going to start being covered by a physical health. We're probably going to pass legislation that basically says every single time a physician prescribes a drug, they also have to prescribe some sort of exercise plan. Awesome. And now hopefully we make that a legal requirement because it's just simply too easy and it's clearly having very bad consequences here. And in the last step would then be basically not allowing physicians to give any more exercise recommendations. They need to refer out to an exercise specialist and they would have a registry that they would do and they would come in and say, okay, well, here's my medical prescription and then here's your prescription to go see Allie and she will take care of your exercise and your nutrition questions. But, awesome. but that needs to be deferred out because we're simply asking them too much. Yeah. Great. So there is actually some positive outcomes coming by the sounds of it. Yeah. And I mean, that's going to be really, really hard. And there's going to be a lot of people and certifications get involved and those things always suck. And But it's a step in the right direction, at least as a concept. So mm. I think that's what people should focus on. That's great. And it's sounding too like we're moving towards your idea of that teamwork, that getting all the professionals who know what they're talking about in their domain coming together to do what's right for the person. So that's quite inspiring. And um, Well, yeah, actually, my colleague, Michelle, the telemedicine thing that I mentioned is she and her team have actually developed an app on your phone that puts your physician, your behavioralist, and your nutritionist, and your other things on a single platform on your app. And so you can imagine being at home and, oh, yeah, I have a question about this. You just hit your app and you send a text to your, your nutritionist or something. And then the nutritionist then consults with the behaviorist and says, okay, well, how's the best way to get this information to, to Allie? Okay, boom, this way. And you can FaceTime with them directly. And this is actually tremendously effective. It's way cheaper and it's way faster. And the adherence is like 97% versus like 8% with people who don't have this app. So that I think is the real future tell of things like that because it puts the whole group, the behavioralist, the psychologist, nutritionist, the oncologist, or whatever other position they're dealing on the same teleplatform. And I think that's probably the future. That's awesome. I'll link to that app in our show notes, as well as all your podcasts and books and, and everything else. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners? No, I think we covered actually quite a bit there. So awesome. hopefully we didn't go too much stuff. Yeah. I've just got to ask you one little question that I ask all our guests on the show. Dr. Andy Galpin, do you have a tattoo? I have two tattoos, actually. And what are they? On my right shoulder, I have a phoenix with the words, it's Latin for rare bird. And on my left shoulder is a giant American bald eagle that's sort of ripping the skin away with an American flag sort of underneath the skin. And why those two birds? You know, I cannot tell you. I have never told a soul in my life behind those two things. And I, trust me, it's irritating the crap out of my wife. She still gets mad that I won't tell her. But I don't tell anybody the rationale behind either one of us. Well, the fact that so you have to leave you in some mystery there. The fact that you haven't told your wife, I'm not going to get offended about that. Yeah. It's not simply nationalism, if that's what you're wondering. It's not <laughs> just like, oh, I'm proud American. Awesome. Well, we'll let, we'll let you keep that a secret, but thank you for sharing everything else with us. Look, I'd love to get you back on the show one day. And once again, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Actually, one thing I will mention, I forgot, I don't know if it came up, but I did just launch my website where I am. It's just my name, andygalpin.com. And any of you folks at home, 
I'm trying to basically take my entire university curriculum and any classes and stuff that I teach and put it up there and, and give it all away in videos for free. Wow. So there's no newsletter, there's no membership, there's no thing you have to sign up for and, and paywall. There's, there's absolutely nothing. And, and part of the reasons I wanted to do that was specifically for people in countries outside of America and England, Australia and things like that, where and they just don't have access to things and they, they can't afford a dollar for a video or anything like that. So those are and will always continue to be 100% free. And there will absolutely be the only barrier to entry is if you have access to the internet. That's um, awesome. So all my health, all my nutrition, all my exercise stuff will, will all be up there. And there is a Patreon account linked to it. So any of you that if you like the videos and you're you're enjoying them. You can feel free to contribute, but I don't want you to, to not pay rent or be struggling financially to contribute. So if you're in that case, just enjoy, learn information and, and become a healthier, better person. And that's, that's payment enough. Awesome. Thank you so much, doctor. My pleasure. It's great to be here. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ally.fitness. If you liked today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review and subscribe. Subscribe.